From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Oh, this is Dr. Von Klauser returning your call, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, doctor. Uh, may I ask who recommended me? I inquired about a good psychiatrist, and it came of you. Oh, yes. Well, uh, the first step is usually an office appointment for a preliminary check. That's what I had in mind. Today? Oh, my schedule is quite full. Would tomorrow be suitable? Today would be better. Oh, I see. But there should be ample time. There for... should be ample time, but there isn't. In fact, I'm running out of it fast. Very well. Eleven o'clock. Dust off your couch. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, California... To National Underwriters Association, 1180 River Road, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the long shot matter. Johnny Dollar, hypochondriac, complete with assorted medical advisors. I needed one of them before I even got down to the lobby of my hotel. It was the house medic, that's item five, five dollars, who'd patched me up yesterday after a thug had worked me over in the hotel garage. Now came checkup time, and the doctor was a fusser, and he disapproved of me. Hold still now, hold still. Yeah, yeah, but that's my head you're digging into. I wouldn't have to if somebody else hadn't split it open. Oh, there. Hey. Well, it looks a little better. Yeah, well, don't sound so enthusiastic. Walking into a wall. It's the best <laughs> I could think of at the moment. Likely story. Hold still now. I want to redress that wound on the other side. Hold still. Temper, temper. Funny. He was working on the outside of my head, but it was the inside that ached most. There were reasons, lots of them. Like the murder of a sick old woman the same day I'd arrived. And the anonymous note that had warned of it. Like the victim's husband and an ex-convict accusing each other of committing the crime. It was a rough one, real rough, because the picture kept changing from minute to minute. And my company was on the hook for $100,000. <laughs> At 11 o'clock, I sat across the desk from Dr. Hans van Clauser, a psychiatrist in his Beverly Hills office. He was small, spectacled, and charmingly Viennese. More important, he was the analyst who was treating Eric Palmquist, the murdered woman's son. Uh, now, Mr. Dollar? Afraid I owe you an apology, doctor. I deceived you a little bit. I'm not exactly here as a patient. Oh, everyone finds it difficult to begin, Mr. Dollar. Uh... You suppose we hear some of the medical history first? Huh? I tell you, we're off on the wrong foot, Doctor, and it's my fault. Here, take a look at these, my credentials. I, I see, then you're hardly here as a patient. About a patient, let's say. My dear Mr. Dollar, I think you know very well that I can reveal nothing which is told to me in this room. I know that. Then the purpose of this visit? I just want answers from a competent authority about a certain illness. I won't bring personalities into it. It's important, Doctor. And the particular illness? Something called circulatory lability. Uh, you know that it's a form of extremely provoked hypertension? Yeah, that much I do. Hypertension is the result of anxieties. The anxieties may be real or fancied, but the hypertension is very genuine indeed and very dangerous. Dangerous to the extent that a man could turn to violence, maybe kill? If sufficiently aroused, Yes, it has happened. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Item seven, ten cents. Recklessly squandered on a phone call to my hotel to check for messages. There was one. Lieutenant Berry of the L.A. Police Department would like to see me at my convenience. Would I? I would. You get practically nowhere ignoring police lieutenants. He stared at the bandage on my head and my assorted cuts and bruises, and his opening line was quite inspired. Oh, what happened to you? Somebody was pretty fast with a gun barrel last night. Where'd it happen? Garage, under my hotel. It seems he didn't like my being in town. You got a look at him? Enough. Want to go through the mug book? Uh, no, I'll catch up with him someday. Besides, whoever was paying him is the interesting one. Yeah, have it your own way. Well, now, you didn't call me all the way down here for laughs, Lieutenant. Anything special on your mind? Lonnie Miller, 
The guy we got sitting in cell number 8A, the prowler who shot Mrs. Palmquist. So Dr. Palmquist insists. He isn't the only one, Johnny, not anymore. What? Yeah. We finally traced the murder weapon. It was bought at a pawn shop in Burbank. The pawnbroker positively identified a mugshot of the buyer, Lonnie Miller. Police identification evidence is a pretty tough thing to ignore. But I was still what the lieutenant called a hard sale. It wasn't stubbornness, simply the fact that I'm very large for motivation. It can be as wild, as woolly as they come, but it's got to be there somewhere. And somehow, with so many good ones around, the worn, faded man in cell 8A didn't raid in that company. I asked the lieutenant for a couple of minutes with Lonnie Miller. He shook his head as though he felt sorry for me, but okayed the visit anyway. Miller? You're angry about something, Mr. Dollar. I can tell. It's in your face. Yeah. About a story you told me the other day. About Dr. Palmquist giving you a lift, keeping him around town, then using you as a patsy so he could kill his wife. You want to change any of it? You asking if I lied, mister? Is that it? That's it. It's figured to be like this sooner or later. Goodbye, mister. Come on, Miller. Talk to me. Lie? You think I'd lie to the only man who even looked like he believed me? You still have an answer. Mr. Mr., don't you think I know I haven't got a chance? That I'm dead? I don't even care anymore. But I didn't lie. Not one word. A Burbank pawnbroker says you did, says you bought the murder gun from him. I've never even been in Burbank, I swear to you. How could I have bought the gun? He identified a picture of you, says you showed your driver's license as identification. Where is your license, Miller? In my wallet, downstairs. They took everything when they booked me. Mr. Dollar? Tell it to me all over again, Miller, from the minute Dr. Palmquist gave you the lift, step by step, every single detail. Tell it to me. He began slowly, haltingly. The words just kind of fell out of his mouth in a tired, hopeless fashion. It was the same story he told so many times now. I had reason for making him go through it. Some small, hazy idea that was tugging at the back of my brain, jagged, undeveloped, but an idea. When I left the cell, I had Miller's permission to look in his wallet. The police custodian showed it to me five minutes after that. The license wasn't there. Expense account item eight, 10 cents, an L.A. newspaper, three days old. One which played up the Palmquist killing big contained pictures of both Dr. Palmquist, grieving husband, and Lonnie Miller, suspected killer. Purpose? To be used in backtracking. The drive down to Long Beach could have been pleasant. Sun, ocean, a relaxing type day, but not for me. Not with what was going on inside my head. Even the soft breeze coming in off the Pacific couldn't sweep the pieces together for me. Sure, for a few seconds, everything would make sense... Then, a moment later, some small fact would make the whole theory collapse. I knew one thing, though. If this whole deal was a frame, it was a great one, a work of art, something to be admired, provided your name was neither Lonnie Miller or National Underwriters. About six miles this side of Long Beach, I found what I was looking for, the little tacos joint where Miller claimed he and Dr. Palmquist had stopped for coffee. Amigo, you, you like some tacos? Sure. Uh, sit down. It won't be a minute. Owner around? <laughs> You're looking at him, amigo. Irving Gonzalez, owner. Irving? Sure. I, I had it changed. Nobody could pronounce Plutarco Gonzalez. <laughs> uh, see your point. <laughs> he doesn't pay to make problems for your customers in business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when are you going to work up to asking the questions, amigo? Well... <laughs> I can make tacos blindfolded, and I can tell a cop the same way. Well, you're not too far wrong. Want to take a look at this newspaper? Either of these men ever been in here? And Dr. Victor Palmquist and Lonnie Miller. Oh, I read about that killing. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, what about it, Irving? What about what? These men. Have they ever been in here, alone, together, any time? Yes, I mean, they... Look kind of familiar, but maybe it's only because I see him in the papers. Do you know? Is that the best you can do? Well, 
Oh, look, amigo, you stand behind a counter all day and everybody looks like everybody else. But you wouldn't want me to make a guess, and that's all I'd be doing, guessing. No, I wouldn't want that. Here, <laughs> nice and hot. Eat your tacos, amigo. Thanks anyway. I'll skip them this time. Here. You know something? I don't blame you. Hey, look at this. Pills. Pills? Pills. I eat them by the dozen. You know why, amigo? Tacos. There's this about the racket. You try, you strike out, you can't waste time thinking about it. You get on to the next step. The step, Laura Considine, Dr. Palmquist's lovely alibi the night of his wife's death. Her house was only a few miles out of Long Beach. It seemed logical to head for it. I reached it about 20 minutes later, a large, old-fashioned, and seemingly deserted house in a promontory that jutted out into the Pacific. Strike out number two, the hostile iron fence that circled it made its point. Keep out, so I did. Trespassing applies to everyone. From where I stood, I couldn't identify the car that suddenly roared away from the back of the house, but one thing was obvious, the driver was in a hurry, and I was getting nowhere. I decided to head back to town. It happened five minutes later as I rounded a curve on my way back to the Pacific Coast Highway. Choice, the Pacific on one side, granite cliffs on the other. I picked the cliffs. Funny what your mind does at moments like that. I remember looking at the mashed inside of the car and wondering which company carried the insurance policy. Then, I thought of how good a marksman a man must be to pick off a tire from any of those cliffs. And then I remembered still another thing. Hadn't I been told about someone who was a great shot, who made it a rule to hunt two months out of the year, no matter how busy he was? Sure. A highly respected citizen named Dr. Victor Palmquist. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final exciting episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, you want to hide something? Put it in plain view. Only don't go overboard on the system if you're hiding a murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>